Good morning, I'm Marge Leahy, Senior Nutrition Advisor to the newly formed ILSI North America Gut Microbiome Committee. Our committee's objective is to bring together scientists and experts from government, academia, and industry to further the understanding of the relationship between food and the human gut micro microbiome and its impact on health to facilitate the research pathway needed to achieve decision-making standards for prebiotics and probiotics in the food supply. The scientific factors include assessing the health and wellness effects that can be contributed by our gut microbial community as well as considerations on food safety. I'd like to welcome you to our first webinar in a series we are developing to help inform our research and projects agenda. Today we have attending the webinar members from our Gut Microbiome Committee and their colleagues. And given the topic, we have invited the LC North America Carbohydrates Committee to participate. In addition, we have some invited guests with interest in this topic. And our speaker today is Dr. David Klerfeld, with who is National Program Leader for Human Nutrition at the USDA. Agricultural Research Service. Dr. Klerfeld has been named, uh, has been National Program Leader for Human Nutrition in the Ag Research Service of the USDA since 2004. He is responsible for the scientific direction of the intramural human nutrition research conducted by USDA laboratories. Prior to government service, he was professor and chairman of the Department of Nutrition and Food Science at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan for 11 years. Before that, he was on the faculty of the Wistar Institute and the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine for 15 years. His research focused on the relationship of diet and prevention of chronic diseases such as cancer, heart disease, and gallstones. Dr. Klerfeld has published more than 190 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. He was editor-in-chief of the journal of the American College of Nutrition for six years and is currently associate editor of the American Journal for Clinical Nutrition. He is also a member of the National Institute for Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases Advisory Council. Dr. Klerfeld has been very active in federal microbiome initiatives. He received his undergraduate degree from Cornell University and both master's and doctorate degrees in pathology from the Medical College of Virginia. And with that, we'll turn this over to Dr. Klerfeld for his presentation. Well, thanks very much, Marge. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, what I want to do um, in the next 45 minutes or so is give you a number of examples of where the field is in gut microbiome research and really tell you why I don't think we're ready at this point to make any definitive recommendations. In, in fact, I view the study of the gut microbiome sort of where the automobile industry was 100 years ago. Um, back in the early 20th century, we had companies in Detroit making automobiles with internal combustion engines running on gasoline or diesel. We had other companies just making steam-powered cars and electric-powered cars. Um, the steering in cars was with a wheel, with a tiller, with handlebars. The tires actually had no tread but were covered in various things to prevent them uh, against going flat from all the horseshoe nails that were lying around in roads. And that's really where I think the field is with the gut microbiome. And so the idea of a beneficial microbiome is not new. Um, here are a couple of quotes on the screen from Louis Pasteur, who basically said life wouldn't be possible in the absence of microbes. And Elie Metchnikoff, one of the first winners of the Nobel Prize in Medicine, um, actually got the prize for figuring out um, the causes of inflammation, but 
spent much of his career, for which he was ridiculed, by the way, studying aging and l relating it to lactic acid producing bacteria. So that, that was, you know, back before we had the kind of quality research that we have today. So you can see how new the human gut microbiome field is. And basically what you'll see on this chart um, is un until 2007, there were so few papers on the human gut microbiome that they don't even show up on this scale. And last year we had almost 800 publications on that. And you just see the way um, the increase has been in, in publications. And in any field of research, the pendulum swings far to one side, then the natural tendency is for the pendulum to swing back in the other direction. And right now the pendulum isn't quite up to the high point on one side of the arc. And part of that is we don't have standard methods for analyzing the bacteria, their functions, or any uh, of the information that we get, generate from these large studies. And part of the problem on that is that we don't really have very good knowledge of what feeds the bacteria. And part of the problem I see is the definition of dietary fiber. It differs from country to country. As most of you know, Codex has set a, a definition which was something of a compromise, but left up to national authorities some of the details of describing dietary fiber. And the, the thing that primarily uh, links fiber um, in, among regulatory agencies is that it's mostly non-digestible long-chain carbohydrates. They're analyzed by different methods that correlate more or less. And the, the real characteristic definition is that the methods of analysis relate to the lack of digestion by our intestinal enzymes. So why would we, we eat fiber if it's not essential, it's not contributing to our health? So the main purpose of dietary fiber is to be digested by the bacteria, to provide energy for the hundreds of millions of bacteria that live in your gut. And a very interesting paper was done by Eric Martins from the University of Michigan a couple of years ago that really get at this issue. Just the single strain of Bacteroides that Eric analyzed found over 400 different enzymes that help digest carbohydrates. And what's fascinating about that number, 400 plus, that's about 25 times the number of carbohydrate digesting enzymes that the human GI tract possesses. So in fact, dietary fiber, I think, is the Rodney danger field of nutrients. It gets no respect because it's not recognized as essential. It's not a single entity. And it makes you poop more. So everybody giggles about dietary fiber. And we, we don't have a lot of really solid research on dietary fiber compared to other macronutrients. So the important question is why would we rely on bacteria for energy if they're there to digest fiber? So the main reason would be it allows humans in more natural states than hunting in a supermarket to vary their dietary intake sources of energy over time and over place. So no single organism has the enzyme repertoire to metabolize the varied foods that arrive in the large intestine. So we need multiple microbial species that allow shifting populations and the metabolism necessary to respond to these different sources of dietary fiber. In addition to growing different types of bacteria, there's other types of genetic transfer of material. 
So we have horizontal transfer of genetic material estimated to be as much as half of the genetic transfer. And this occurs through plasmids, which are viruses that, that attack the bacteria. Um, sorry, ba bacteriophage are the viruses that, that attack the bacteria and transfer genetic material. Plasmids, direct transfer of genes also occurs. One of, one of the issues that we have in studying microbes in the intestine is almost everything we know is about the bacteria, but there are also fungi, archaea, and viruses. Um, there have been estimates that the bacteria are equal to or up to 10 times the cells in the human body, but the genetic capabilities are even more great than that. The human genome is considered to be about 23,000 genes. The bacterial genome is considered to be 3 to 10 million genes. So we're talking about 45 to 130 times the number of genes in the colonic bacteria as in the human body. So an important question that's, I think, unresolved is, is fiber bioactive or is, it, or is it essential? The Institute of Medicine DRI Committee came up with a um, conclusion that it is not essential. They didn't say it's bioactive, but on the screen is a proposed definition that the federal government put out um, in 2004. Constituents and foods or dietary supplements other than those needed to meet basic human nutritional needs, which are responsible for changes in health status. So by the current definition, the fiber would be bioactive, although FDA doesn't recognize it as such. So the microbiome is needed for normal digestion, normal nutrient absorption, integrity of the entire GI mucosa, not just in the colon, and normal host metabolism and immune function. So from my interpretation of those requirements, fiber is essential. And you have to also bear in mind on that graph I showed you in the second slide with a huge increase in gut microbiome studies around 2007, the committee from IOM made this definition in 2002 before we had a lot of information that the microbiome truly was essential. So people don't like to eat a lot of fiber, and in this slide, one, one of the priests is saying, I've switched from self-flagellation to high-fiber diet. We still have a lot of resistance to consuming high-fiber diets, and that's really what your bacteria need. So you're going to feed your bacteria with dietary fiber as the primary nutrient. But just as we have meal eaters and, and meal grazers um, um, among people, the constituents on this slide can shift in relative importance. So resistant starch can be as much as fiber in the diet and actually become the main nutrient source for bacteria, while fiber might be somewhat less. Then we have other unabsorbed macronutrients. Um, when I was in graduate school, I learned that protein and fat are 100% digested in the upper GI tract and absorbed. We know now that's not true. A couple of percent of those macronutrients are not absorbed. Certain carbohydrates are not absorbed. So there's, there's partial absorption of lactose. There's, partial absorption of fructose in certain people. Those can act as food for the bacteria. Mucin is the, the lubricant that is um, excreted along the entire GI tract that lubricates move of digesta and bacteria through the GI tract. That is also a carbohydrate-rich mucopolysaccharide that the bacteria digest. The bacteria are cannibals. They eat the dead bacteria. And about up to 54% of fecal mass is bacterial bodies. So it's really a very large amount. 
and the soft cells, your intestinal lining turns over every three and a half days. So there are lots of different constituents um, in the intestine that can feed the bacteria, but um, in a quantitative fashion, fiber and resistant starch are by far the most important factors. And your bacteria, whether you're eating only plant food or non-plant food, really are there to digest these fiber-like sources. So you can see this in the next slide. Um, th these are analyses of the gut microbiome from different species of animals at the top. And what you can see here is in the green dots, each one of those represents the analysis of the type of bacteria that are there in the gut of herbivores. So we, we have um, gazelles, bighorn sheep, giraffes, horses, rabbits, um, zebras, and they're, they're quite separate from the other um, species. So in red down on the lower left we have uh, ha carnivores. So that would include um, big cats, hyenas, polar bears, echidnas. And then in the lower right we have the spots representing omnivores. And uh, in there are baboons, lemurs, humans, dogs, variety of other species. And what you can see is the types of bacteria, the OTUs, the operational taxonomic units that we can identify based on their genes what species of bacteria are there. We can clearly differentiate herbivores from carnivores and omnivores. But if you look below, we have the same species there looking at their keg orthology groups. Those are the functional genes that are the metabolic genes that control the functions and digestion of those bacteria. And what you'll see at the center are the genes that characterize the herbivores. And that's because they're digesting the fiber. That's the prince. No matter if you're a carnivore, an omnivore, or an herbivore, the primary function of the genes in the bacteria of the large intestine are to digest carbohydrates. And so the carbohydrates in a carnivore might be coming from the mucin, the slough cells, the other bacteria, but not from fiber. And then you can see the lines radiating out represent the red or the blue characterizing the carnivore, carnivore or omnivore-based diets. Shown in the next slide is actually a different type of analysis showing a similar result. In this case, analysis of fecal microbial composition only from humans, not different species. And on the left, we have just the phylum identification of human feces. And you'll see really two phyla. In the light blue at the bottom are the firmicutes, and in the dark blue above the bacteroidetes that represent 70 to 90 percent of all the bacteria in humans on a Western diet. But what's really interesting is you look at the rainbow graph on the right here. These are the functional groups again of the same analytical um, samples from the same people. And you can see, despite the zigzag pattern on the left, you get very, very similar metabolic capabilities on the right from these human samples. So what this tells me is the functional characteristics are less variable and potentially more important. It's more important to know what the metabolic capabilities are than who the bacteria are that are in the gut. In addition to the bacteria, there's really an important gap in the research and our understanding of the other species in the colon. And in human colon, it's estimated that between one-half and two percent 
of the microorganisms are fungi. And here's a paper that just appeared in the last couple of months in the journal Science, looking at three different types of anaerobic fungi that live in the large intestine and in the environment as well, and their capability of digesting cellulose and other sources of cellulose, um, which are shown on, on the slide here. But if, if you look at the left column of glucose, here is the relative growth rate of these three types of fungi with glucose. And then you look at cellulose and microcrystalline cellulose, two different brand names, even Avicel, which it goes into animal diets and, and goes into um, tableting pharmaceuticals and is believed to be completely non-digested, is digested almost as well as cellulose, as glucose. So the issue is if we're not analyzing for fungi, we're missing an important metabolic component of human feces. And almost none of the papers that I read talk about anything besides the bacteria. So because of that, we're going to come back to bacteria and, and see some examples of important studies in the last couple of years. And one of those is a study that was done on a group of Hutterites. Hutterites are a religious sect somewhat like Mennonites or the Amish. Um, they live primarily in uh, central Canada, uh, upper uh, Midwest United States. And what makes them an interesting group to study is they live a collective lifestyle, so they eat together all of their meals in the same room um, at the same time with the same foods. That doesn't guarantee they all eat the same food, but they're offered the same food that's available on the table. And this simply looks in this slide at the average amount of servings in the winter and in the summer of fresh produce and canned and frozen fruits and vegetables. So the summer time consumption is in the reddish bars here, and you'll see almost four servings a day of fresh produce and maybe one serving a week of canned or frozen produce. In the winter time, you can see only about one and a half servings of fresh produce and about almost a serving a day of canned or frozen. So really what this says is there's a significant difference in the total consumption, and I think you can simply using some logic guess that there will be different types of fruits and vegetables consumed in summer and winter from people who depend on what they grow for an awful lot of their food. And if you look at the fecal analysis um, seasonally in these people, you can see this on the next slide, on the left side is the abundance of different phyla based uh, in the winter and on the right side during the summer. So what you see immediately is you have on the lower left here in, in this bluish gray, you have actinobacteria in the wintertime in most of the subjects, but not all. But then that disappears in the summertime. You, you see sporadic um, appearance of it, but really a, a significant decrease in that. Then you'll see in this pale green, the bacteroidetes um, really increases during the summer with correlated with increased fresh fruits and vegetables with a concomitant decrease in the firmicutes. And then there's no real definite pattern with the other more minor species there. But what this translates into, primarily because of, of the significant reduction in the actinobacteria. Um, the next slide is one of the different measures of diversity of the fecal microbiome. There's actually a summertime decrease in diversity of the bacteria that are there. But what's missing from this is a functional analysis of the bacteria. Um, so we don't have that in the majority of studies. 
but one of the things that's important is age is a factor and basal diet is a factor which is shown in this slide. Um, what you'll see here is um, the red dots represent samples from people living in Malawi in Africa. The green dots are um, American Indians living in rural areas of Venezuela and the blue dots are from Amer Americans living in the United States. And what you'll see is that the samples tend to peak um, in numbers of species of bacteria from about the age of eight and stay steady to middle, early middle age and then tend to decline, especially in the U.S. population. And that's more prom prominently shown in panel C in the lower right here for adults. There are significant differences in the total number of species for each group, with the Venezuelans having um, the most, with around something over 1,600 different species in the fe fecal samples, the Africans having something over 1,400, and the Americans having something around 1,200. So there's quite a large difference in the numbers of species found. Again, one of the gaps in our knowledge is we don't have analyses of the total number of bacteria. We can infer from the fecal mass that the larger the fecal mass, the larger the number of bacteria, but unfortunately very few studies present that. Another researcher research group tried to look at the types of bacteria that were correlated to weight gain. I'm sure you've all heard that um, Jeff Gordon's group initially um, said that the ratio of bacteroidetes to firmicutes was diagnostic of whether or not someone would have significant overweight and that they could transplant the bacteria from an obese person into a mouse and they would gain weight, transplant the bacteria from a thin person into a fat mouse and they would lose weight. Well, for every study that confirms the Gordon Labs observation, there's another study that cannot confirm it. And in this um, study, they try to correlate different species of bacteria with weight gain. And they actually found that their model explained two-thirds of the variation in weight, um, which is better than a lot of other people can find. But what's really interesting here is the top green bar, the longest one by far, the taxonomic annotation is none. They don't know what species of bacteria are related. Um, of course, all of these other bars do relate to that, and a few of the species, um, two of them here in purple, Bifidobacterium and Fecalobacterium prausnitzii here, relate to bacteria that have been correlated to gut maturation. I want to move on and, and talk about um, some of the characteristics of what affects the microbiome. And this is really an important study that came out earlier this year in science. On the left is a bar graph for reflecting analysis of the feces in over 1,100 Belgians. And on the right, the same analysis done in over 1,100 Dutch participants. And so Belgium and Netherlands are next door to each other. Their diets aren't dramatically different. Um, but we find very different analyses here. So um, what I'm showing you is just a, a tiny portion of the graph in the original paper. They actually show 69 different factors that are identified in the Belgian population that correlate with something in the microbiome analysis. And what you'll see at the top here the longest bar is the Bristol stool score. Um, that was developed by John Cummings many years ago, and it's a one to seven numerical score of just 
the looseness or firmness of the stool. Um, you'll see in, just below that in, in the same light color blue, time since previous relief. That's simply the number of defecations in, in a day. And so there are a lot of other factors in here which you wouldn't necessarily think using what we know about physiology would be connected to the microbiome like red blood cell count um, and hemoglobin, uric acid, kidney function index, BMI is here, age is here, gender is here, use of antibiotics is here, height is an independent risk factor for appearance in some of these populations but not all both. So if you look at the right side here in the green bars, you'll see there are some blanks here. Only about a third of the factors identified in the Belgians were confirmed in the Dutch sample. And what's important here is the scale, which unfortunately is cut off. But this bar for the Bristol stool score is only 5% of the total variation. And what's really surprising is on the right side, this LL deep population of the Dutch, the total length here um, with the age bar, that bar is only 1% of the total variation. So what it boils down to is these independent factors here are not additive. And this is shown here that the cumulative combined effect in the Belgians of all of those 69 factors works out to only 16% of the effect on the different bacteria. And what turns out to be the most is medication. And it's things you would expect, like antibiotics, such as amoxicillin or tetracyclines. But it includes other medications, such as estrogen and progesterone, in post, that are given to postmenopausal women. Blood parameters is the second, and bowel indicators like Bristol stool score time between defecations. Dietary information is third, fourth on the list. It represents less than 6% of the combined effect size, so it's not a heck of a lot, which is surprising. But it's one of the few things we can actually control in research studies. So I want to point out that we can actually transplant, as I mentioned from Jeff Gordon's lab, we can transplant feces from humans to mice. And this was done by another group, um, again, earlier this year, where they took kids in Malawi who were either healthy or um, underweight and, and stunted, so they're less than 5% of the normal growth rate, and they took the feces and transplanted those um, into mice who have defined bacteria. That's what notobiotic designates. And about half the bacteria in the mice that were colonized became the human bacteria. And what's really fascinating is just transplanting the mice into normally, sorry, transplanting the bacteria into mice that were normally fed significantly reduces their weight gain and their lean body mass. So essentially we're creating stunted mice just by transplanting the bacteria from stunted children. So there's something beyond the lack of proper nutrition. This is a study from uh, CSIRO in Australia from David Topping's group, and this graph shows the butyrate concentrations in fecal samples from 40 volunteers um, after either two or four weeks on a diet that, that was the typical Australian diet, and that would be the lower dotted line here, which is about 15 millimoles per kilogram of uh, butyric acid in the feces, and adding 25 grams of 
non-starch polysaccharides or fiber plus 22 grams of resistant starch. So that's a pretty high indigestible carbohydrate diet. Doesn't increase the butyrate that much, only about 18 from 15 millimoles. But what's really interesting is that the people consuming the lowest amount tend to go up. Some of them don't, probably because they don't have the bacteria in their gut to make enough butyrate. But what's really fascinating to me is the people on the right quartile here that were the highest, they're all re almost all reducing their butyric acid production, suggesting to me that the two tails of the curve are coming closer to the normal in the median. So that's why I think there is, hasn't been such a big difference in the average increase, but the tails are being flattened out to where the ends of the arrows are. But one of the things in this particular study that wasn't so great is the correlation between butyrate in the feces and ammonia. Ammonia is produced primarily from fermentation of protein, and it's clearly demonstrated to be toxic to the intestinal cells, while butyrate is thought to be beneficial. And there's a fairly strong curvilinear relationship of greater an R squared greater than 0.75. Um, so that's not very good but it's really a fact of life that fermentation might actually be a two-edged sword here, that we're producing beneficial and not beneficial products. One of the strange things about the presence of bacteria is that it can affect digestion of amino acids from the intestine. And here we have conventional and germ-free mice that have been catheterized with um, in the portal vein, the, the main vein that drains the liver. And what you can see here is th these are all the amino acids that were analyzed. Um, Germ-free mice in the darker brown, conventional mice in, in this pale yellowish color. And on almost every amino acid, whether they're essential, conditionally essential, or non-essential, most of them are actually significantly different. The statistical significance is designated by the asterisk. Um, and you can see the majority of these amino acids are different. And you can see in these box plots huge differences here across some of these with absolutely no overlap whatsoever in absorption. And the same thing is actually found in human beings. And here we have groups of women um, who live in the US India or Jamaica, looking at arginine bioavailability. And on the left side, you can see in the fasting and post-absorptive state, Indian women absorb less arginine. They have lower whole body citrulline flux, and they excrete less mannitol into the urine, all markers of arginine metabolism. And what's really fascinating uh, about this paper uh, is that there's a significant difference in the Indian women who have reduced arginine bioavailability and metabolism. They have significantly more Prevotella and significantly less Bacteroides in their GI tract. Now, right now, this is a correlation, but it's, it strongly implicates the fact that the presence of bacteria in the, in the large intestine affect absorption of amino acids and metabolism and excretion in the rest of the body. So we clearly don't understand how the GI flora functions as another organ in the body. Um, again, another study to demonstrate um, diversity of bacteria having an effect. 
Um, th this is an analysis of children with short bowel syndrome who are on parenteral nutrition, which means they're not getting any intestinal nutrients, that they're being fed through an intravenous. And what I've done is outline um, in red boxes here the five children who have short bowel syndrome who are still requiring um, intravenous nutrition. And then the other uh, bar graphs here in the different colors are short bowel syndrome who have been weaned from parental nutrition or their children who are healthy and don't have any symptoms of intestinal problems. And what you'll see is that the lines in the red boxes are simply dominated by a single type of bacteria, not necessarily the same. In this case, we actually have four other children with the same species, one with a different species. But if you look at all the others, we have multiple colors representing different bacteria. And this is analyzed statistically in the next slide. There's a huge difference in the diversity of the kids on the lower left here on parental nutrition and the children off parental nutrition. And having a greater diversity of bacteria, I believe, is important because it likely reflects differences in functional capabilities of those bacteria. Unfortunately, again, we don't have those functional analyses. But because bacteria can generate a new generation of bacteria in 20 minutes, all we need to do is introduce one or a small number of bacteria and you get millions in your intestine within days. So an important, um, important study that I want to spend some time and show you several slides on is um, that done earlier this year in Nature from the laboratory of the Sonnenbergs out um, at Stanford University. And this is a mouse study where they fed um, a normal laboratory diet that they designate high microbiome accessible carbohydrate, or MAC. And this is the typical mouse or rat chow diet that's made up of ground up corn and soybeans and wheat and has fish and other ingredients in it. Um, against a low microbiome accessible carbohydrate diet. This is the purified diet that's made up of casein, I, um, isolated carbohydrates, cellulose, corn oil. So we have 5% um, cellulose, which is uh, sulcaflock, uh, not well fermented, um, versus um, in the high MAC diet, a 15% neutral detergent fiber, so probably 20 plus percent total dietary fiber um, in this high MAC diet. And this was fed to mice for four generations. And what's really fascinating about this is here's the, in the first bar on the left, you have the initial diet with bacteroidetes being um, the dominant bacterium in the gut of these mice at about 60%, and then Clostridia being the second most prevalent, making up about 90% in total of those two families of bacteria. And as you go to generation one, two, three, and four of these mice on the same diet, whether on the, the low or high fiber diet, there's a progressive loss of the bacteroides with replacement primarily with the clostridia um, and some growth of these minor families of bacteria at the top. But it's primarily a switch of these two. And what's really fascinating is you can take mice from this fourth generation that have lost the bacteroides and give them a fecal microbiome transplant from a normal mouse and put them on the high carbohydrate diet and you can restore the original 
ratio of those bacteria. So we have generations of, of people on Western diets that have had lower fiber over years. Maybe we've lost certain species that aren't given a lot of attention because minor species tend not to get the same respect as the more dominant bacteria. So actually what the Sonnenbergs did was look at the capability of these bacteria to digest um, carbohydrates. And this is just one set of um, glycoside hydrolases that, um, but you can see that there are about 20 or so across here. And what happens is the controlled diet, generation one, the, these red bars, there's barely any change um, in the species, uh, in the capability of all the species of, of glycoside hydrolases. But when you put them on even a high carbohydrate diet, but over four generations, they are losing the capability of digesting the fiber because the bacteria are changing. So it's, it's, it's clear that some of those bacteroides species that are disappearing over four generations are playing a significant role in digestion of the carbohydrates. And of course, digestion of carbohydrates primarily um, have been studied to look at short chain fatty acids. The, those um, acetate, um, pyruvate, and, and butyrate um, are, are the, the primary bio, uh, sorry, short chain fatty acids. But there are lots of other fermentation products. And um, th this is a schematic diagram from one of David Brenner's recent papers who has significant evidence that the metabolic products of fermentation in the large intestine are actually absorbed here between the cells in the colon through loosened up tight junctions that are then absorbed through the lymphatics, go to the portal vein, and then actually affect the body um, and especially the liver. And David's premise is that non-alcoholic non steatohepatitis, which is now considered to be epidemic just the way obesity is in the American people, there are estimates that between 10 and 20 percent of Americans have fatty liver. We don't necessarily know that we have fat de deposition, but that can go on to produce uh, inflammation in the body and diabetes and, and a number of other metabolic abnormalities which become clinically apparent over time. Um, so the, the issue is, are we missing something in our diet that can help prevent that? Whether it's the raw material to be fermented, the, the prebiotics or the probiotic bacteria that are necessary to ferment that. And one of the th topics that we've learned over the last few years is the short chain fatty acids. Um, I was taught in graduate school 40 years ago that the colon uses the butyrate and none of it circulates. Propionic acid goes to the liver and is ex extracted in the first pass. And acetate does circulate. Well, it turns out that's not true. Um, we've learned that all of those fatty acids circulate um, in low quantities, but there actually are a variety of short chain fatty acid receptors in most of the tissues of the body, including the central nervous system, um, in, the, in the kidney, um, in skeletal muscle, in liver. You know, so if you just think of the weight of all of the organ systems that are on the, this slide here. It's almost the entire lean body mass and white adipose tissue 
and brown adipose tissue are here. So we're talking about total body having receptors for all three of these short-chain fatty acids. So there are lots of potential functions of fermentation products besides short-chain fatty acids. And one of the functions of the short-chain fatty acids is very likely to control the um, tight junctions in the colon. And what we see here are two different measures of permeability of the intestine. On the left, um, we see um, rats that are on either a normal diet in the black bar or intravenous feeding total parenteral nutrition in the white bar. And you can just see the electrical resistance is much higher in rats that have, um, con sorry, rat rats that have um, contents going through their intestine. And what you'll see on the right side is fluoresce fluorescein labeled dextran, um, which is a large molecule that shouldn't be absorbed very much through the intestine of the large intestine, but what you'll see is low absorption in the black bar, very high absorption in the white bar with, without intestinal contents being present. So there's a lot of permeability to uh, nonspecific markers here, and in fact, it's been demonstrated that people who are not consuming fiber or, or are on total, total parenteral nutrition have increased bacterial translocation through the intestine, absorb some of these carbohydrates that shouldn't be absorbed normally. So we have lots and lots of functions being controlled by the microbiome. Um, and they're summarized on this slide. And although this was a very comprehensive review that I took this um, diagram from, I, I've listed a variety of other factors which were missed um, in this review of the microbiome. And you can see that the microbiome is responsible for degradation of these large um, non-digestible carbohydrates with production of short-chain fatty acids, production of peptides, production of vitamins, vitamin K, vitamin B12 is produced by and absorbed in the colon. Um, uh, there is modification of the bile acids. Secondary bile acids are actually created in the colon and reabsorbed. You know, when I, again, when I was taught physiology, um, I, I the very short section in my physiology book said the colon absorbs water and some electrolytes passively with water, and that's it. And we know that's not the case anymore. In, in fact, we published in the late 1980s that the rat colon absorbs bile acids in, in very significant quantities. And so we know that's true now in a variety of species. Um, but the microbiome also affects epigenetic marks or methylation of the stem cells that are reproducing the GI lining. Um, it affects whether or not the GI pathogens are going to interact with and, and get through the mucosal barrier. And certainly the microbiome has the potential to affect risk for chronic diseases like fatty liver, cardiovascular disease, and colon cancer. Um, there are methods to tell us some of these things, but not all of these things. And so it's important to know that we can analyze for who's there. That's the operational taxonomic units at the top here that we, we can identify the species of bacteria. We can identify the functions of those bacteria. But it's really difficult right now. Um, there's very limited capabilities of analyzing the transcriptome and the proteome of the bacteria. We can do the metabolome of the fecal bacteria at this point. 
um, but it tends to be much more expensive than just analyzing for 16 sRNA. You know, it's a factor of a hundredfold to get the better genome than the 16 sRNA analysis of who's there. So just, um, there's a useful quote from this um, article, at present there's insufficient evidence to use the changes in the fecal metabolites um, as markers of prebiotic effectiveness. So we just don't have um, enough right now to be sure of what species of bacteria we need or what type of fiber we need. And these on the slide are today and tomorrow's analyses. But I want to point out, there's a lot of old observations that still are useful. Just as I showed you the previous slide on that Belgian and Dutch population, some of the strongest correlates with the types of bacteria that are there are the transit time and the Bristol stool scale. Um, so decreased exposure of the mucosa to the me microbial metabolites can be reflected in tra transit time. That's affected both by the fiber content and the microbiome. The gut pH is altered by the, the microbiome. And this is important in changing the enzyme optima, the solubility of products, and the metabolic capabilities of the bacteria that are there. Um, I mentioned stool volume several times. With increased bacterial mass, you're going to have increased bacterial numbers. And you're going to potentially have decreased concentration of metabolites in the stool. So the question is, what's being absorbed in, in the upper colon? We don't have very good numbers for this. And then uh, the stool hardness, um, you'd have less water in a harder stool, less diffusion of metabolites, but counter to logic, a harder stool actually seems to analyze out with greater microbial diversity. So the issue really can be summed up in this way. There are a lot of simple answers that the field is chasing. There are a lot of complex answers that only a few laboratories are working on now, but I think more people are going to be going to the right than the left in the future. So that's really the end of my presentation, and I'm happy to answer questions at this point. Great, Dave. Thanks so much for a very, very interesting presentation. Um, we have some questions that were sent in ahead of time, so I'll pose these to you. Um, and the first question is, what are the gaps in the science to determine if specific members of the gut microbial community and or their metabolic output are linked to a beneficial change in physiology? Well, that's a really good question. Right now, we don't have any specific members of the gut microbiome or their metabolites that are linked to changes in physiology. I mean, we, we've got a lot of papers that claim that, but for the bigger claims like diet and obesity, we've got equal numbers of claims on both sides of this. Um, but one of the problems we have in this field is that we have samples of feces taken from subjects on self-selected, uncontrolled diets. So we need somebody to agree to put people on a standardized diet for four to seven days at a time to decrease at least the variation as a result of diet, um, that's not going to decrease the person-to-person -person variation dramatically, but given the huge amount of variation we have within people and across people, any degree of decrease in variation 
will help control for the many variables that play into these analyses. Great, that's a really, really good point. Um, let's see, the second question we have here is, can microbes and their metabolic byproducts someday be biomarkers for health endpoints? And what are your recommendations for research to achieve such relationships? Oh, I think um, NIH is spending millions and millions of dollars, as is USDA, um, but not quite as many millions, on exactly these targets. You know, we, we'd love to be able to find a, a species or two of bacteria or particular chemical metabolites that are the markers for a healthy lifestyle or vice versa that we can target to reduce. Um, I suspect it's going to be a number of years before we have this because we're going to need a combination of large-scale observational studies with really good assessment of the diet and the rest of the lifestyle like exercise which does affect transit time and the microbiome and we're going to need focused small-scale controlled feeding studies to have a totality of evidence that steers us in the right direction. Great. Um, then let's see, another question we had is, what is known regarding physiological changes and potential benefits that can be attributed to the conversion of dietary fiber by our gut microbiota to short-chain fatty acids? It seems to be one um, metabolite class that's been pretty well studied. Yes, it has. And I, I can guarantee that if you have a pet white rat, having more short-chain fatty acids in his intestine is good for his health. Health Canada ex ex accepts short-chain fatty acids as a benefit. FDA does not at this point, and I, I don't think there's real unanimity among re regulatory agencies on this. So, you know, we, we have a legal answer from the regulatory agencies, then we have a scientific answer um, from research, and we clearly do not have any definitive answers. Um, but as, as I showed in one of my latter slides, we have short-chain fatty acid receptors found throughout the body. Um, that tells me we need short-chain fatty acids. We're not producing them very much in our organs. Most of what's circulating is coming from the bacteria in the large intestine. So we're depending on that. And, you know, our usual response is, oh, if a little bit of butyrate is good, a lot more is going to be better. We simply don't have any information of what the optimal levels of those short-chain fatty acids are. I mean, fermentation is a marker of a healthy response to fiber, but we get fermentation to lactate, we get fermentation to other products, including the bad ones like ammonia I mentioned, trimethylamine oxide is another one which has recently been um, discovered and is thought to be particularly bad for cardiovascular disease. Um, the, the real problem is how do we analyze all of these data? We've got maybe 1,000 to 1,500 bacteria, we've got hundreds of metabolic enzymes to measure. How do we just take all that big data and analyze it together? And that's really where the bottleneck is right now in understanding what's good for our health and what's just a spurious correlation. Thanks, yeah. Um, excellent, excellent points. I know the one study you showed on Butyrate increasing along with ammonia certainly underscores your point here. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, next um, question. Do you have any thoughts, insights on the implications of a low fiber, high protein diet on the microbiome? Well, I certainly do have um, reservations uh, about the Atkins diet and the paleo diet. Um, because they're not 
done in a sensible fashion. And in fact, uh, I, I know the Atkins group sells psyllium and, and other fiber supplements to go along with a low fiber diet. Um, but you know, the average person who's on this type of diet doesn't necessarily follow all of the recommendations. Um, clearly, on a low fiber diet, we have a very significant decrease in transit time. Um, we have decrease in fecal mass. All of this contributes to reduced function, reduced number of bacteria. Um, we don't have any solid studies on this. I would love to see somebody do a well-controlled study to give an answer on this. So right now, I've got reservations, but I don't have data to back up those reservations. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, really interesting area, and that's interesting on the addition of psyllium supplements for the Atkins diet. Um, and let's see, here's another question. What are your thoughts on efficacy regarding the existing fiber-based clinical double-blind placebo-controlled intervention studies for irritable, irritable bowel syndrome and also outcomes corresponding to changes in microbiome profiling analyses? Well, one of the problems with studying irritable bowel syndrome is it's a catch-all definition and it's likely not a single syndrome with one cause and, and one or, or a limited number of treatments um, because we know already from uncontrolled studies that some people on a high fiber diet have a redu reduction in sy symptoms and some people actually get worse with the same intervention. Um, we have a, a physician at one of our USDA Nutrition Center's Rob Schulman, who's basically identified a profile of bacteria in the feces of kids with undiagnosed abdominal pain, which is essentially the childhood version of IBS. And he right now doesn't have a way of correcting that. You know, again, I think we have the potential to correct those bacterial imbalances, which hopefully will reduce symptoms. But my suspicion is it's not going to be the same answer for all patients with that condition. Thanks. Um, excellent points. Very complicated area, obviously. OK, here's another one. Um, you had mentioned that um, having controlled having some studies with controlled diets for four to four days, four to seven days would be a best practice as an intervention period for diet and microbiome trials. What's the evidence there, Dave? That's a good point. Um, the, the main reason I would suggest that time um, to put people on a standardized diet is four to seven days, I think, would include 100% of subjects with the very slowest transit time that you would essentially clean out whatever was there and ha you would have enough generation time for the new bacteria that are affected by an intervention diet to replicate and within a week I think you would have um, ref a, a diet content and microbiome content reflective of that change. Um, there was a paper last year that um, diet actually does change, or, sorry, microbiome does change within a matter of a few days. Um, so I, I, I think four to seven days is a safe bet. Great, and because I know there's a lot of interest in best practices and um, controlling a number of factors is needed. So I think that is one that's very, very important. Um, another question, can you speculate on whether adding fiber would be more beneficial than adding a single probiotic to the diet? That's an intriguing idea, but think back to the series of slides I showed you from 
Justin and Elizabeth Sonnenberg's group um, with the mice on the four generations where when they fed the high fiber diet it didn't repair those missing bacteria and so something like a symbiotic which Marcel Robofois proposed and I, I really dislike that term because I think if you want to market a product, synbiotic just sounds bad, even though it's spelled S-Y-N, biotic. Um, but that's probably where we need to go. We need to get the right bacteria and the right amount of fiber, and that will be the target for improving health. Great. Uh, yeah, I think that would be a very interesting area for um, future research, certainly. Um, your last slide showed two different paths, which indicated there's that path of simple but wrong versus complex but right. And I guess this gives, brings us to a very nice area for a closing, and that is what are your recommendations for research needs going forward? Wow, that, that's... A a big topic, but I, I think science in general has focused on a reductionist approach rather than the contrasting solution-oriented approach. And what I mean by that is the reductionist approach changes one thing at a time. So we've tried that for obesity and pretty much nothing works one thing at a time. So a solution-oriented approach would be change your diet, change your environment, change your physical activity, change some of the other factors around you that motivate your behavior. Change four or five things and a whole more holistic approach. And I think we need that for the gut microbiome. You know, just putting the right kind or the right amount of fiber might not be sufficient if we don't have those bacteria that we need. Similarly, eating a yogurt with the right bacteria isn't going to do us any good if we don't have the raw material to feed those bacteria if they survive to the colon. And we've got a number of laboratories that um, ha have been looking at these types of areas, but nobody focuses on the whole mixture of solutions. So I'd like to see that happen. And, and I don't think um, the food industry is going to be able to promote one ingredient or one probiotic or, or even a mixture of 29 probiotics, which I see being sold, um, as an answer unless they do a controlled feeding study that clearly shows a significant health benefit. Yeah, that, that's really interesting, and I think when you're talking on this um, solutions-oriented approaches with changing a number of factors, that's where you really get into this whole um, informatics then big data analysis, which I think um, is really, really a challenge. Oh, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, that, that's one of the constrictions we have in USDA. We, we hire bioinformatics people, and then once they really know what they're doing, um, industry usually um, hires them away for three times as much money. And I've heard the same thing from the NIH metabolomic centers um, that are based at universities. Um, this is the real issue, is how do we analyze the thousands and thousands of data points we get from each intervention study we're conducting now. Yeah, and with that, one thing that kind of pops into my mind is with the um, great opportunities, I think with the uh, bioinformatics and analyses that are um, allowed is really looking at hypotheses generating versus proving out hypotheses. Um, what are your comments in that area and best practices that you would see there? Oh, th that's a really valid point. Um, most of the observational studies can be treated just like other 
dietary observational studies that they cannot by design prove cause and effect, that we need controlled feeding studies um, along with a clear mechanism demonstrated to close the loop on some of these observations. Otherwise, they're simply correlations that aren't proving cause and effect. So I, I, I'm with you on, on this 100%. Um, we're we're going to need more sophisticated and more expensive controlled interventions to prove cause and effect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Klarfeld, for this really, really informative webinar. And it's our first in our series, so we really, really appreciate your taking the time for this. And um, that really covers the questions that have been sent in by the group. And um, we'd like to thank you so much for taking your time and also to Courtney McCumber for her role in helping set this up. So thanks a lot, and with this, we conclude our webinar. Thank you.